Hello, well, welcome to this In Conversation. And those of you who have actually watched some of the others will know that uh, these are the events that we're doing in place of the usual events programme we would have uh, by recording conversations with uh, personalities and businesses in Farnham that hopefully tell a story, give a bit of background to Farnham. Um, and I select people who've got an interesting story to tell. And I think my uh, In Conversation colleague today, Mark Robson, who is the chair of the British is it Institute of Innkeepers or Innkeepers Institute, but we'll come to that, but also managing director of a Farnham-based business, Red Miss Leisure, which is based, I think, in the Co Coxbridge Business Park. So without any more to do, let me introduce Mark. Mark, hello, how are you? Hi, hi, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, I'm very well, thanks. Pleased to be here. Well, thank you for responding to the, uh, the invitation because what was behind that was very much what we've all been through in the last, I guess, coming up for 13, 14 months, which is an unexpected, to put it mildly, situation, which has affected every business. But in particular, hospitality has been in the eye of that storm. And uh, it was suggested that maybe with so many pubs and restaurants that characterise Farnham, somebody who was at the centre of that would be an interesting story to have and a perspective to give. So I'd like to start with that, Mark, if I may, as you are the current chair, I think that's right, of BII. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I'm coming up for what am I, about two and a half years in that role now. Um, so it's been a, an interesting period to to be in that in that position, um, and um, yeah, it, it's 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 um, it's probably been a very relevant time actually to be involved with uh, one of the main trade bodies in our uh, industry because I think it's reinforced to members how important trade bodies are. This is nine thousand. I think there's nine thousand members, isn't there? In yeah, the... we're a bit over ten thousand now. Um, right. And the, 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 you know, in a, a sort of in a nutshell, the the, the BII has is essentially represents um, licensees up and down the countries, up and down the country, um, and um, we are one of the the main uh, trade bodies, uh, if not the main trade body in the in the pub sector. And our membership is made up of um, individual um, publicans and people that are part of multiple estates like, uh, like myself. And um, I suppose over the last 10 or 15 years, we, we've gradually had a, a slightly declining membership because most of our traditional members were from the least untenanted sector of the, um, of the pub industry. And that, that part of the industry has been declining steadily for, for many years now. Um, but I'm really pleased to report in the last sort of year, 18 months, uh, and, and particularly during the, the COVID period, um, we've managed to reverse that decline and, and started to pick up some new members again, which is, which is great, really, really important. And we've had to diversify our, our offering to, to do that. Um, do, you think, do you think the pandemic and the difficulties that that's created, as I said, you know, for the hospitality sector has sort of brought BII into, or British Institute of Inkeeping into focus for people and said, well, let's wrap that around us because you offer business service support and a variety of things. Don't yeah, you? I, I think it has. I, th I think, I think what's, look, if you're, a, if you're an operator, one of the things that's been really difficult over the last year is uh, deciphering the various realms of uh, regulation and information that the government and local councils have published. And, you know, it's been a roller coaster that has changed on a very, very regular basis um, from one lockdown to another. Um, and, you know, it, it's difficult. We've got enough going on looking after our, protecting our businesses and our teams. It's difficult to understand. Um, you know, you get the, the headlines from the from the, the prime minister, but actually, for us, the important bits, the detail, and deciphering that detail is is complex. And so, the BII, have, have, along with other uh, key trade bodies, have been really, really important um, in in making sure um, very quickly after new guidance is released that they go back and challenge and scrutinize the guidance and clarify the guidance 
and then they they uh, translate that into normal language and, and publish it out for the members. And that in itself has been a phenomenally difficult and challenging task, but I think the BII has done a, done a great job with it. And I think the other very, very key point is that we have two other key trade associations uh, in hospitality. Uh, the BBPA, which is the British, British Beer and um, uh, pub association yeah, uh, yeah. which has a lot of pub members but also a lot of brewing members and UK hospitality which covers the broader hospitality sector including you know hotels visitor attractions contact caterers that sort of thing. and and I think where we've had particular success particularly in the last year um, 18 months is that those three uh, trade bodies are very very joined up and they uh, they lobby into government on a on a one voice agenda. Um, so they talk to. There's a lot of communication between the trade bodies. Uh, they're very unified in what the messaging needs to be to government, and and actually that that results in effective lobbying, which in turn uh, achieves good results. And particularly early on in the pandemic, um, I think the the lobbying that went on between those three associations was incredibly effective mm. in obtaining the right level of support for for, um, for our sector. So it's interesting you mentioned, you know, a BBPA, I think is, yeah. Yes, um, yeah. And I was particularly going to focus on or focus raise UK hospitality because, mm. you know, when we've seen the news and one thing and another, it's UK hospitality that tends to be a bit of a That's spokesperson right. for the yeah. sector. Well, I was wondering the whether, news, yeah. yeah, I was wondering whether three trade bodies actually diminished your uh, lobbying effectiveness by splitting the membership. But you're saying actually the reverse. It's I, it's. I, I, th together. I think it, it's a good point. I think it would. Look, the reason you see uh, Kate Nichols, the chief exec of UK hospitality, often on the news is because, you know, her role is to represent the views of the industry, and she is really the spokesperson for the the industry. And by the way, she's done a fantastic job in the last eighteen months and deserves all the recognition she has rightly got. Um, and so that the, the one of the main functions of, of UKH is to lobby and um, you know they have a, a, a seat at the you know the the relevant table within uh, government uh, we're a you know we're one of the, I think we're the third largest industry in the UK we employ you know 3.2 million people so um, each each one of those trade associations has their own agenda obviously and their own membership. Mm. Um, and I think you're right, it would dilute the message if, if they weren't unified in what they were saying. And there are other associations within the, within the sector, but they're not nearly as big uh, and don't represent nearly as many people. And um, they, they tend not to be as combined. And, and, and so the, the messaging has to be unified for, us to, for it to be effective. And it, and it has been. What sits behind my question is a bit of my personal background in that I've been a chairman and an international chairman of a of a national institute it happened to be logistics mm -hmm. but we had exactly that you know we had the rha the road haulage association we had the freight transport association and we mm -hmm. had the institute of logistics so i i remember well how you get you know share of voice and you get the right mm -hmm. access but it's mm -hmm. nothing there's nothing like a crisis to bring people together on a common agenda is that that's, a, that's very true yeah and you are still fighting that agenda aren't you you know there are yeah. some very live issues still there, there are i mean there's a, there's an awful lot of issues that are still rumbling on and um yeah i mean even even this week we've had you know there's been pressure on government to clarify certain bits of guidance that that was published after the uh, pm's address on uh, easter monday and and there are things that are still not sorted out like the um the issue of rent uh, in particular for uh, pubs and restaurants that have um uh, landlords and are in dispute about um rent payments that they've struggled to make over the last year and that that's something that the government has, has got to deal with along with a, a whole raft of, of 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 other things and um yeah it's 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 never ending actually the there's a constant um barrage of of um you know information to relay and points to to clarify and and uh, agenda points to to scrutinize so it is a it is a, an ongoing uh, battle with no but we but we're having this conversation with the sun coming out over the horizon there i think mm. because the 12th of april uh next week is when you can 
partially open um, again, at least on an outside basis. So you're involved in a pretty busy week, I imagine. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty hectic. And I had a had a call with some industry colleagues this morning uh, about I, know, I guess 15, 20 um, uh, MDs and chief execs of various different different companies, big and small, up, up and down the country. And um, yeah, it's it's a difficult week. It's a it's a tough time. Um, I think sort of breaking it down. I think everybody is pleased that you know the government has stuck to April the twelfth, which is which is helpful. So we've all got some some clarity that we you know we will be opening the pubs that we can open on on Monday. Will be there is a lot of people, particularly those that are in town and city centres, that are not in the fortunate position we're in, where we've got mainly pubs with with decent outside areas and with gardens so they're they're not able to open a lot of their venues so that's that's um fairly is, is, is that a high proportion i mean you know of what have we got we've got about forty eight thousand pubs in the uk now so you know yeah, what is I, it, 5 I, I think we're so? expecting about 60 percent to open i think in look, i mean we've all been to pubs in you know london or manchester or wherever and they you know they don't tend to have outdoor outdoor areas do they so no, that, that's no, a complete no. non-starter um and and you know for the likes of somewhere like london they're still missing all their commuters so or a big chunk of their commuters so that it's not particularly viable for them to open even if they did have out, out outside areas um and to be honest those that don't have outside areas that are relying on um uh, some Sort of help from local councils in terms of trading on streets or pavements and that i mean they're 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 in such a challenging situation because the lottery of what local borough you fall in at the moment is just um you know it's so uh, difficult because the array of, of 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 councils and the effectiveness of those councils is 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 so is so um disparate right where right the way across the course some are very helpful and recognize the the challenge that our sector has faced and so they're as keen to, to help as they can be and they want you to you know they want to block off roads and 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 uh, close roads so you can people can you know eat and drink outside safely and um allow off roads to to, to to trade in that way and others just won't even talk to you you know they won't return a phone call or an email so it's, uh, it's been it's been um it's been difficult from um you know from that perspective but you know, as we've seen in the last 48 hours, 72 hours, we we know that this time of year brings very, very, you know, changeable weather. You know, we've had some really nice weather over the Easter weekend and we had we had half an inch of snow in Farnham or around Farnham yesterday. So, you know, now, come on, that, come on. That, that, that is going to dictate a lot of how people trade over the next few weeks. As, I, uh, I wrote I wrote to a colleague saying, um, you know, um, we seem to be edging our way back to something we might recognise as a, a, as a way of life of 18 months ago. Mm. Now, if it snows on Bank Holiday Monday, I said, never thinking it would come true, then we know we're edging our way back to normal because we've had typical Easter weather, haven't we? That's, well, put we up, have. I mean, I was... put up a gazebo in the garden myself, but I'm yeah. thinking, I, I'm not sure I want to use it. I, I think most people, I mean, if you cast your mind back to last April and we, you know, we yeah. were all at home, but we had the most phenomenal weather, didn't we? And mm. I think it was written on the stars that it wasn't going to be quite as good this year. Um, so let me just uh, confess to, you know, another past uh, uh, involvement. I, I was in the brewing industry for a while at the time of the beer orders in the late, okay. in the late 80s. 80s and yeah was involved with the launch of Entrepreneur. Now, you know, that has echoed through the evolution of the brewing industry and the pub industry since that time. I, I was interested to see, and I'm going to look at the number here, I think we had 64,000 pubs in 1990. Yeah. And that's about a third of those have been lost. I think the current estate is down to about 48,000. Yeah, somewhere what, in that region, yeah. What do you see as the likely impact? I know this is a crystal ball thing of, uh, of COVID. Is it going to have accelerated? further rationalization in the pub estate or will That's innovation a, keep people going and i'm thinking yeah. of you know, takeaway and service development etc where, where do a, you feel about that it, it's a good question um and i, I and the, the the correct answer is i don't know yeah. uh, and, and no one does and we won't really know until we know when covid finishes um yeah. 
that mm. you know there was news in the papers this morning you know that that government is worried about a third wave and you know if if that happens then we won't be fully open by the 21st of june as the government said we would be and already they're sort of rescinding on that with their sort of talk of vaccine passports and, and that sort of stuff certainly doesn't look as clear cut as it as it was made out to be when the government announced it in february so where, where's it going to look there's definitely going to be some collateral damage um yeah. being caused on the back of the last 15 months or so. that, 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 that is for sure um if we can get out of COVID within the next three to six months. I think a lot of businesses that are really cash strapped now and struggling uh, will trade very hard over the spring and the summer and they'll be okay, they'll survive. Um, and, and go on to flourish undoubtedly and go back to their growing ways and hopefully restore some cash in the bank, et cetera. If COVID goes on and um, it goes on beyond the next three, six months, I think it's going to be an awful lot of businesses, big and small, uh, established and, and, and otherwise, that, that are, are just going to go to the wall because they're just, there'll be nowhere else to turn. They won't be able to borrow anymore. Um, there'll be no C-bill, bounce back loan type type offering. And, and, he, and even if the government tries to reinstate that, I don't think they'll get support from the banks on it. And I think it's there's you know it's going to be a fire sale of companies that are really really you know mm. decent companies that that are distressed. But so the, is this a last man this is a last man standing type I, of opportunity. I think, it, I think it's unlikely, but I think it could go that way if if we if the vaccination program doesn't work um, or doesn't continue to suppress COVID the way that we have seen it suppressed in the last sort of two months. And and obviously we all hope and believe that that with the phenomenal job the countries done uh, with deploying the, the vaccine that, that that continues so um but you know we're only a couple of months into that we don't know the longevity of it we don't you know we we don't know whether further variations of it are going to cause issues etc cetera, etc cetera. we all hope it doesn't obviously and if we work on that basis that we will get rid of, rid of covid or covid will be at a controllable flu-like level um in the next um three or four months then I think yes. Look, there's there's going to be some damage in the sector. There's a, a I think this kind of probably falls into two sectors. I think two sections. I think there's those people that have um, have sadly exited the the business uh, the the industry because they've lost their businesses or, or they've not managed to survive COVID financially, so they've gone bankrupt mm -hmm. or otherwise. And I think there's those that have probably questioned whether they want to be in the sector anymore and have sort of probably in the last year have thought, you know what, I, I actually just, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do it. Hospitality is a tough enough industry as it is. And a lot of people have gone and got other jobs, you know, or, you know, they've spent their time on furlough and just reconsidered yeah. whether it's the industry for them. And I think there's quite a bit of fear about, about that in the industry generally. Uh, certainly from a recruitment point of view there is um, um, so I think there will be some some damage there will be um, you know a number of opportunities out there um, and we've seen already in the last couple of months an awful lot of investment come into the sector or potential investment come in really? a couple of deals already because you know we recognize or or, or, or People recognise that, that that there will be significant opportunities within the um, within the pub sector, and so you know they they they're using the current time to um, ensure they've got some some cash or some backing to to go out and do some deals and and buy some pubs that hopefully are pretty a pretty relatively cheap price. I was going to come on to that because you know there's always an opportunity as as the challenge of this magnitude you know is faced up by businesses strong and weak and it can actually shake out those that perhaps don't have that strength but let me take you back to um, better times and uh, on a personal basis Mark you know when you decided to um, get involved in this industry I mean mm. why did you decide to get involved in this industry? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, actually. I, I, I suppose kind of for two reasons. I mean, I wasn't academic. You know, I've never been a particularly academic guy. But, you know, I kind of went to school because I had to and I didn't really enjoy academia. Uh, you know, I got by, scraped through everything. Um, I think some of that was lack of ability and a lot of it was probably lack of effort on my part. 
Um, but I always enjoyed service. I always enjoyed uh, hospitality and people and, and the social nature of what our, our industry is about. And um, yeah, we had, a, we had a local pub close to us when, um, you know, when I was sort of growing up in my, my sort of mid late teens. And, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty grotty place. Uh, in fact, it was, it, was, it was locally known as the Shit and Shuffle. And um, uh, some guys took it over one day. They did it up, and and they did a roaring trade, and it, it still does a pretty good trade now. And that, that always kind of stuck with me. And actually, what it offered was was not complex. It was uh, it was a good, fun environment that people wanted to be in with good food and good service, and and that was it. But we always enjoyed going there, whether it was a quick sandwich at lunchtime or you know a decent meal on a Saturday night, and. Um, and, and so for me, that, that always stuck with me. Uh, and uh, I then sort of headed off to university and decided to study, um, you know, catering and, and uh, business and hospitality. And then, and then went into it um, uh, when I graduated and, and uh, had some experience in event catering, contact catering, and, and recognised that probably wasn't what I wanted to do long time. So uh, long term. So I, yeah, it's sort of, 15, 20 years ago, I just, just decided, right, I'm going to, times right now, I think I've had some experience, I think I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to go and get a pub, and that's essentially what I did, um, and made masses of mistakes for the first five years, as you do when you start a business, which was probably too young, I was, I was in, still in my 20s then, I was probably too young to go and, you know, I was probably a bit young to go and do it, and a bit naive, but, but we struggled through, and, um, uh, actually, we were very fortunate. We were, you know, I, I started the business in 2004 and the whole industry fragmented uh, when the credit crunch hit in 2008. And perhaps a bit like now, there were an awful lot of opportunities on the on the flip side of that. Mm. And um, and we took advantage of that and we bought, uh, we had four pubs then, we had, we bought the the freehold of three pubs that we were leasing and um and that was really you're awesome. already you're already running those as yeah we're already running them we were just leasing them and we weren't making a lot of money out of them if i'm if i'm honest because they needed some investment but trying to get investment into we're trying to borrow um against the pub lease is, is very difficult um, mm. and uh and so yeah we managed to to find a, a a banking partner that lent us the money to to buy those pubs and and actually we never looked back you know we invested we you know, provided the investment that, that they needed and pretty much overnight doubled the turnover uh, in each of them. So I think you, you, know, you graduated around about 2000, didn't you? you know, yeah, somewhere, somewhere in that the, Yeah, people don't talk about Y2K now, but, you know, there was some uncertainty around Y2K. It was, it was me, Very good for consultants. But um, you started Red Mist Leisure in 2004, as you as you just mm. referred to. And now I must ask, because I'm wearing a red jumper in honour of <laughs> speaking to the managing director of Red Mist Leisure. Red Mist, where, where did that come from? Yeah, well, it's funny. Everybody asks me that. It's a bit oh, of a strange good. name, isn't it? Um, look, the, 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 the guy, one of the guys, my, my sort of best friend that I was at university with, also called Mark, um, we um, we always joked about having a a, a business, and uh, his nickname was Red Mess because he had a very short temper. Oh, I was going to um, ask. He's usually on a golf course where he was snapping his seven iron or something like that. And uh, we never really gave much thought to the fact that the, the name would be of any real importance. We always just sort of felt that the the trading name of the pub was 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 the important bit, which you know it is still to this day. Um, so we just said, well, we'll call it Red Mist Leisure, and that's that's what happened. And, um, but yeah. your first pub, you know, I, you, you looking at your website, you're a Surrey and Hampshire focused business, which we'll come right. to in a moment. But actually, your first pub was in Charlwood near Gatwick, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, which was in Surrey actually. It was just on the yeah. Surrey Sussex border, um, and it but, was. And, and was it, that just an opportunity, or you know, there was no great plan behind that, or was there? No, there wasn't really. I mean, we had a plan for the business, uh, although we sort of developed, evolved, and changed that as as we went along. But um, it was a great little pub actually, um, nice little village. Yeah, just just on the on the Surrey Sussex border, next to, next to Gatwick, but it. By the time we had got to four pubs, um, and we had, like I said, it was our first pub in 2004. We we, we went into the credit crunch in, in 2008. We'd got four pubs by then. 
we we recognized we'd learned some lessons we knew what we needed to do we wanted to buy the the freehold of the properties that we had and and develop them on but to be fair that pub was a very small pub it was a perfect starter but it just didn't have the scope it wasn't big enough for us to develop so we disposed of that lease pretty much at the same time that we we bought the freehold of the uh, of the others mm. um yeah so that's that's the story there you also focus on you know the the mission being the traditional pub and uh, one hears a lot about the traditional english pub but let me challenge that a moment aren't these just restaurants with some beer sales because isn't that the biggest revolution that's happened, the foodie revolution? I think it's, I think it's, look, it's driven by consumer habits, isn't it? And, and yeah. we, you know, in the service sector, you give people, you know, you, you try and satisfy people's wants and needs, okay? And if you think back 20 or 30 years, pubs were very male dominated. Um, they were generally unwelcoming, uh, unwelcoming. They were not particular. There was very little focus on design or atmosphere. Uh, obviously, we still had smoking in pubs then, which has been gone nearly 15 years or so now. Um, and actually, we started to become a healthier nation. We started to, uh, to become more discerning. We all started to go out uh, more and enjoy... Um, socializing together as a family as opposed to dad or you know going down the pub with his mates or stopping at the pub on the way home from work um, which was kind of what the boozer sort of was really or, or walking down after dinner and a pint with his, his mates sort of stuff and pubs, pubs sort of recognized um, you know in the sort of you know early 90s that there was a real market in the in the female and family uh, part of the mm audience and and started to to tailoring to started tailoring to that and and prior to um and and so design became more important and um you know softer furnishings slightly cooler places for people to be smoke free uh, back then it was smoke free sections or non smoking areas um and um and also that that drove food as a as an important consumable and, and all of a sudden the, the quality of food started to become more and more important and and kind of back then it was either your traditional landlord landlady that was cooking a you know a traditional pub pie or bangers and mash or something or it tended to be pretty poor quality food that was regenerated and all of a sudden we had this sort of gastro rev revolution where people realized uh, operators landlords realized that um, you could drive a much better far more profitability out of your pub by drawing people in to come and have a meal um, and, and a good quality meal, um, which in turn meant they would enjoy a gin and tonic, a, a bottle of wine, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Much better margin, higher margin drinks that went with them. Now putting on a, a piece of food. Just, let me, on, on, yeah. just let me come in on, on the drink thing because uh, wasn't another of the influences in that period of development the fact that you couldn't really make a pub work any longer with with retail style rents just selling um of the wet sales just having the wet sales i think i think that's part of it i think also the you know back then we had a labor government we had the beer duty escalator and they massively you know there were the, 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 there was massive uh, tax added on to to beer in the you know, in the um, in the early 2000s, and it really, really crippled the the industry. And so, actually, the industry was doing very, very well, and it really started to, to, to decline when beer tax was really driving up the, the the cost of a pint. And you know, I've only been in the pub industry, you know, 15, 16 years, but the the price of a pint has more than doubled in the time that, in fact, it's it's gone up by about 150 percent since the time I've been in. So. Um, not, not only did we have financial pressures from um, from landlords and from uh, you know business rates and that sort of stuff, but also pubs started to become unaffordable for people. You know, going three or four times a week, which was very much the norm in the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, it just wasn't affordable anymore. You know, going in and paying you know 253 quid for a pint and it was going up, and now you pretty much can't get a pint in Surrey for under four quid. Um, you know, it, it's not cheap. 
and uh, especially if you if you want to bring a rabble with you, you know, if you want to bring your family or, you know, um, you know, it's an ex expensive affair. So all of this was the big melting point of what was changing in the pub industry at the time. You know, consumers were changing, uh, the face of the industry was changing, and and everybody was trying to sort of um, find the most successful way through. And, and as a result, we have lost a lot of traditional pubs that relied on people going in, that didn't serve food and relied on people going in seven days a week and having a beer. Those pubs are pretty much, mm. don't really exist anymore. Um, but I absolutely would refute the idea that pubs don't exist because, you know, what is the definition of a pub? I think the fact that the definition of a pub has evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. And, you know, for me, a pub is about, uh, uh, about a very special space where you can go and uh, eat, drink, socialize, relax, uh, be in a fun environment and have a good time um, responsibly, safely. And that, that's really what a, a pub is about. Now, I think you should be able to go to a, to, to a pub and have a, have a bite to eat with your, you know, with, with your family, including children. Um, but I think you should better, you know, you should better go to the pub and have a few drinks with with your wife or your mate or whoever it is. And I think pubs have learned to try and segregate and cater for for people's different needs at different times of the week, um, at different times of the year, um, and and try and offer as much as they can to as many different markets as they, as they can. And they don't all get it right, and you know that that's that's obvious, but. Um, I think more and more so they they do get it right now and i think more and more people enjoy a pub visit now than they probably did 20 years ago i think you have 10 pubs in the in the red mist leisure estate i think you've got an 11th haven't you under development i'm just yeah, interested right. to see what you look for in a you know as you grow the estate is it has it got to be a certain size or and how do you go about making the the ambience, the ambience, distinctive, because another thing you feature is that you want each one to be in the way that you've described, you know, um, a special place, but you're not stamping these out. So, you know, I can go into one and it's different to the other. You, 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 yeah, I, I think that's important. a distinctiveness. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I feel quite strongly about this because I still feel there's a lot of very average pubs uh, in the in the UK. And a lot of those, I think, are average because um, they there's a bit of a cookie cutter approach to the way that they uh, design, refurbish, you know, um, th those those properties or those pubs, and and we we try and and maybe as you as a big company that's understandable to an extent, but it's not especially for someone in the trade, it's not surprising to walk into a particular brand of pub and see the same rug in one side to another side, or the same chair or or what have you, which I find a little bit uh, irritating if I'm if I'm honest. I think because because pubs have always been hubs of communities and they've always played a and particularly rural pubs have always played a really key role um, in in bringing people together and supporting you know local 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 charities sports teams you know hosting uh, dance teams wh wh whatever it is pubs are about people and about community and so I feel when when we Sort of look for a pub. Uh, we have obviously have a, a type of pub that works for us. It has to be a, a reasonable size where we can get sort of you know 60, 70, 80 plus covers internally and, and hopefully have a, a decent sized car park and a you know good external areas or at least the opportunity for, for that. But I think we owe it to what a pub is about to make sure we do our research on the pub, uh, we understand the history of it and that we sympathetically refurbish it. Or, does, or, or, or make sure that our design is 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 in keeping with the history and the character of the building. Mm -hmm. um, very often, it's a it's a listed building, like the one in Farnham is Grade Two listed. So, any changes you make there are, you know, ha have to be done carefully in conjunction with you know local councils and listed building officers, etc. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of that's the approach we've always taken is uh, mm. is to try and make sure that it's not we don't just look at it as another pub. It's well, what's special about this pub? What's the community about? Um, 
and, and where does this pub sit within it? And, and most of the pubs that we have taken on historically have generally failed in the communities they've sat within. And so we've kind of taken, and, and some of them were, you know, at risk of, of being lost, of being one of those statistics we talked about earlier. So we've tried to take that responsibility fairly seriously and say, okay, well, look, what, what's got, what, you know, what, what has this pub got wrong, wrong in the past? Where has it failed? And what does the community need? And mm -hmm. that's what we've tried to, to um, deliver. Essentially. And you've included sort of business networking events, haven't you, in some of your pubs? I think yeah, you... I mean, we, do, we, we do all sorts. I mean, I think community engagement is important. I mean, if you look in the, the town centre in Farnham, because we're part of a, um, a, a town centre, you know, you're, you know, perhaps sort of, you know, sponsoring the, you know, there isn't really a sort of a village cricket team to go and to go and get involved in or, or sponsor or whatever. So you, you have to look at it in different ways. And, you know, the pub we've got in Farnham now historically wasn't a pub. In fact, it was a restaurant prior to our occupation. I remember. I remember. So it doesn't have that. Uh, it doesn't have the pub history. It has history as a building, but it doesn't have the, it's a beautiful pub with, with great history, but we, it doesn't have the the, uh, the story behind it that most of our properties do. So yeah, you, you have to respond to the market that you're in. And uh, obviously in a, in a town center, the uh, a small town like, like Farnham where you've got you know, 20, 30, 40,000 people on, on your doorstep, you know, the, the town is different. And so the responsibility there is about engaging with the, the local, all communities, but, but particularly the business community and, and offering a service to them. And, um, you yeah. mentioned a little while ago that you you know you you, you like Farnham. You're a great great uh, supporter mm. and hopefully advocate for Farnham. I think you yeah. certainly are. So I was going to ask the question of what brought you to Farnham because you know I, I referred to the fact that your first pub was in Charlwood near Gatwick and I think you were then in East Clandon. So yeah. you you've based your headquarters here in Farnham. Yeah. So well, it was. You'd be surprised to learn it was a pub that brought us to Farnham. So well, we we took on the uh, we, we took on the Duke of Cambridge in Tilford, which is a couple of miles outside of Farnham. Yeah. You probably know it. Uh, in 2006, and uh, that was the first time I'd ever been to Farnham, and uh, I really liked the area, and, and actually it just developed to be pretty much the centre of our patch, if you like, of our heartland. So when we, um, you know, when we wanted to to get a bigger more professional office sort of five or six years ago Farnham was the obvious place to do that mm. um so yeah that's that's essentially why we we and and look we like Farnham as well it's, it's such a nice <laughs> vibrant town it's, it's you know, okay it's yeah, okay. it's going through a bit of change and development uh, as we know at the moment um and um yeah hopefully it will come out that bigger and brighter and and stronger well, let, let, let me ask you about that, because we've, you know, we've talked about the national picture in terms of the hospitality sector. But of course, here in Farnham, we have a, a still a, a relatively large number of pubs. I mean, I was interested to see that although the pub estate has declined, I'm not just talking Farnham here, down to its 48,000. It's amazing to think there's still 59 pubs per 100,000 people, I think, is the uh, the national... Is that statistic. right? Okay, that's the statistic right. I wasn't aware of, actually. Oh, well, there we are. Uh, free consultancy for you, Mark. But in Farnham, you know, we've got a proud brewing heritage. That's the, you know, the background of Farnham. Do. How, do you, how do you see Farnham develop? As the high street gets hollowed out, my words, with traditional retailing, is this going to lead to more hospitality venues or is the difficulty of getting into hospitality as a result of COVID going to mean further consolidation? H how do you see Farnham? Well, look, the, 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 the high street was having a torrid time before yeah. COVID came along. So, you know, it's just accelerated the, the trend. Yeah. And we know that, and although, you know, we've talked about hospitality today, we know retail's had just a, you know, a pretty tough time, mm. certainly bricks and mortar retail in the last, uh, in the last 12, 12 months or so. So I think the high street is uh, up and down the country is going to really struggle for, for a while and Farnham will be no different. And, and to be fair, Farnham's had lots of vacant um, shops and units for, for a long time. And uh, there's well publicized reasons behind that. I think business rates are, are one of the high rents and business rates are probably the, you know, two of the worst culprits. Uh, for example, our, our unit on, um, uh, Castle Street um, pays £52,000 a year in business pay rates payable, which is staggering, I think. 
uh, as opposed to most of our country pubs that pay under half of that, if not a third of that. Um, so if we're going to if we're going to impose pretty high, pretty lumpy rents and pretty high business rates on businesses to trade in the town centre, then you know they're they're not going to do it, particularly with retail when they you know the, the the real growth in retail has been online over the last ten years, as we as we all know. Well, it's not a level so, playing field, is it? Because it, you know, it isn't, online it isn't. doesn't have any of these costs. That's right. Well, you know, if you're online, you can go and sit in a business park in a deprived part of the country where you've very often been given a grant to to be there, and you'll be paying peanuts business rates. Um, and your your venue might be might be ten times, fifteen, a hundred times bigger than you know than a, a bricks and mortar traditional club. So, um, but look, part of your question was, you know, is hospi hospitality going to fill these voids? Well, look, the one thing we know about hospitality is a very very creative and entrepreneurial and resilient sector. There's no doubt about that, and and we see that with what's happened in the last year and how much. The, support hospitality and pubs have given to their communities and how people have you know have, have turned on grocery uh, services or, or uh, takeaways or, or whatever things that we don't traditionally do um, to bring a few you know mm. a few pennies in and also to, to help out the people that they traditionally serve um, I think I think hospitality can be part of the solution but I think there's a bit of shock that needs to go on first and I think rates and uh, I mean, we've been waiting for years for a, a rates review from the government, which they yeah. took off again a couple of months ago, or they delayed again. So um, we need, um, uh, you know, we need that to be conducted, and we probably need rents to to um, you know to level off as well, or to 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 come down to more realistic levels. And of course, the longer landlords are sitting there with empty units, the the lower the rents will go until they can find a tenant. So. Mm -hmm. I do think hospitality will will help solve that problem and will help solve the high street. And high streets are becoming more experience based rather yeah. than you know product um, you know product based you know retail environment. So um, I, I think I think that trend will continue, but I, I think it'll be a while before we see any sort of major recovery. What about, you know, the development in Farnham? And I, I'm mm. conscious of the time. So coming to the end, you know, there are going to be a lot more retail units coming on the market, which is going to make it difficult in the not too distant future. Or are you optimistic about, you know, that that creating a rejuvenated sense? I, I think Farnham, Farnham's an interesting one because it's it's not Guildford. So it doesn't have the pull or the power or the population of Guildford. But Farnham has... It's very desirable. It's got lots of, um, uh, you, you know, very uh, high quality housing in and around it. It's, that's a strong housing demand in Farnham. And it's also a very pretty market. Place. So I think it's, it's, it's got lots going for it. Um, I don't think, I think I'm actually a supporter of the development in Farnham. I think they, they, they're trying to address the, the you know, the, the poor side of Farnham that's that's aesthetically undesirable and and actually hasn't I don't believe offered an awful lot to the town in the last sort of few years. So I definitely support that regeneration. Whether they've got the mix right of of retail and uh, housing and you know uh, other offerings, you know, time will tell. There's no doubt that those retail units they're creating there are going to be a tough sell um mm -hmm. i suspect they'll probably benefit with some pretty generous um you know subsidies from from the council to to get them filled um so yeah it's it's an interesting one but it will cause it'll shake farnham up a little bit and um you know the development of east street will probably cause some issues on west street which is exactly why we sold a pub there um, a couple of years ago, because we we had the foresight that this was uh, this was going to this was going to happen. Well, look, Red Miss Leisure, you're at eleven units now, and I'm I'm coming to the end here. Um, you'll continue growing it, will you? Yeah, I hope so. We we've, we've just gone through an investment cycle ourselves in the last uh, in the last few months, and and we concluded that at the beginning of the year. So. Um, yeah, that's given us um, the the cash we need to to grow the business for the next five years. I think we'll now that we've got a really good infrastructure in the business, we've got a, a great head office team, and um, you know all the key people in the right places, which which takes time to, to build. We've got strong foundations. I think we will 
probably look to accelerate our growth over the next over the next few years and and um yeah with the it. same ethos we know local produce yeah absolutely great yeah, menus so. etc yeah, i mean we we'll, we'll continue to refine what we do and try and make it better and you know be as consistent as we can and we don't want to grow you know without you know by taking our eye off the ball but yeah absolutely that's kind of what the company's built on that sort of you know that 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 great culture those key values that we have um supporting local communities and and you know wherever possible buying locally using local uh, suppliers and and farmers and growers and that sort of stuff so we'll very much you know that will very much be the forefront of what we do going forward well we shall watch with interest um and uh Let's hope we can get back out into your and other venues uh, sooner rather than later, because yeah. one of the things I think many of us miss is just that visit for a pint or a, or a glass of wine. Um, but for the moment, and with an optimistic outlook for Farnham, and thank you for that, Mark, um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your time today. And wish well, you you're all very welcome. Future. Thank you for having me. It's been, uh, it's been fun and a real pleasure to talk to you. Not at all. Very nice to uh, have this chat with you. So thanks again, Mark. Thanks, Richard.